Patrick Ruffini, thanks so much for taking the time to join me today. Thanks, Ben, for having me. So I know a lot of people who have been coming up to me on the street, uh, recognizing who I am over the last couple of weeks, asking me about polling. So I figured I would ask you about polling because I'm tired of answering questions for people as if I know anything about polling uh, other than reading the numbers uh, that exist. I'm sure that you have your own opinions about what happened in terms of uh, the 2022 polling and uh, both things that hit and things that missed. Tell me a little bit about your opinions about what went on there and how polling performed in the 2022 cycle. So I I would almost say that this election was the Republican version of Hillary Clinton 2016 in terms of, um, let's say, maybe not necessarily the polls heading into Election Day uh, or, you know, the polls in the last let's say, few weeks of the election predicting this huge Republican wave. Um, but the vibes definitely predicted a huge Republican wave. The belief that, um, you know, Republicans would somehow close strong. Um, uh, predicted a huge Republican wave. But the actual election we got was very close uh, to the polls that uh, that existed three to four weeks out. Um, you know, we had a poll in Pennsylvania about, uh, you know, three weeks out from Election Day that nailed the results within, uh, you know, within a point. Uh, our poll in Nevada a couple weeks out, same thing. But we also had a poll in Georgia at, at the very end. It wasn't just the Trafalgar's of the world, some of these some of these groups that were accused of going in and polluting the averages. It wasn't just those groups that were showing uh, just better Republican results going into Election Day. Um, you know, uh, you know, we were told in particular our Georgia poll was right on track with uh, where the Walker internals had that race. Um, so. Um, uh, so I think there was absolutely, in the last week, somewhat of a mirage for Republicans. Um, and if you just looked at, um, you know, the surveys that were conducted really in the last month of the election, you had a pretty good picture of what was what was actually going on in this race. And I think that's possibly something we need to be doing moving forward, especially with early voting, especially with. Um, you know, if there is going to be, if Republicans are or, or, or what Republicans are going to, you know, gain ground in the last few weeks of the election, that's, you know, a lot of the votes now are going to be baked in based on early voting, based on absentee mm -hmm. voting. Um, so those late surges aren't going to do you very much good. And I think, you know, I think that was possibly the case here. Well, one of the things, and I say this obviously as someone who was off by, you know, 25 seats, essentially, when it came to uh, the House result. You know, one of the questions that I had kind of uh, coming from this is how much the polling for these statewide races uh, factored into what we were seeing further down, meaning that, you know, one of the things that I was concerned about was obviously something like the Doug Mastriano campaign in Pennsylvania, you know, being potentially a, a problem with a big Shapiro win. You know, one of the things they were concerned about in Georgia was, you know, if Brian Kemp was going to win by so much uh, that he would be able to drag uh, Herschel Walker over the finish line before, uh, you know, any potential uh, runoff uh, concern, meaning the Democrats in that in that race were concerned about that. How much did we actually see that play out in terms of the these statewide races uh, having significant effects? Because then there's kind of the contra contrary examples in New Hampshire and you know Joe Lombardo winning in Nevada, but not Adam Laxalt. Um, what what did we see in terms of those statewide races playing into uh, results lower down? I mean, I think the only place you can really say something like that really happened was Florida. Mm -hmm. And it was a 10 point shift for DeSantis. I mean, that was probably, I mean, uh, probably the biggest, let's say, turnout effect I've almost, I've ever seen almost because it's such good data in Florida. And, uh, you know, what that was, um, was, you know, DeSantis being on track for 10 point victory. And then you just had this added element of Democrats just threw in the towel mm -hmm. and about 800 Democrats didn't vote <laughs> like the 800, like literally 800,000 Democrats that should have showed up did not show up. And we could see this in real time because Florida tracks who votes in real time and like post this on election day. 
you have a pretty good idea. And I was looking at these numbers and saying, not only not only is Florida going to be great, it's going to be great national. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. going to be great on the national on the national in the national environment if you're seeing something like this in Florida, even if it's just a tiny bit of what we're seeing in Florida, it'll be a great night. But I do think that partly, partly we saw a problem that was exactly like the 2016 problem in that we were really focused on the generic ballot polls um, to Mm -hmm. a large degree. um, And those polls were correct. Those polls were maybe a point off. Of where of where we expected them to be, but we had very little race by race polling, especially in house races. So the main point, or one of the main points, as far as a Republican underperformance would go, would be that like, hey, these house, you know, we only gained like you know five, you know, however many house seats. Um, and the real reason for that is we had no real good. There was no good measurement of those house seats, and there was an assumption that the sort of national trend would somehow result, I mean, the underpant gnome hypothesis as it relates to elections, like, oh, well, the generic ballot number must be this, and therefore, you know, we're going to see 20, uh, a 15 to 20 to 25 seat gain in the House. Mm-hmm. Um, but what, what really happened was Republicans underperformed in those really key, uh, you know, Biden uh, seats that only went for him by five points or less. I mean, there was virtually no swing towards the Republicans in those seats. Plus, so many of those seats have been taken off the table in redistricting. So I think the people's impressions of, all right, why this underwhelming result? Well, you know, you know, there was no generic house race polling that would have, you know, kind of confirmed this. Um, And I think people were just going like they, you know, have gone or went off the national polls in 2016 when we don't have a truly national election. Mm-hmm. for either the presidency or the house. So uh, one of the, there are a lot of different explanations that have been thrown at me uh, about this. Um, one of them obviously is Republican concerns about the abortion issue and how it would play out. What did you actually see in terms of the result on that question? Because to me, it seemed to be kind of inconsistent, but similarly to say the concerns about quote unquote election denial or uh, or concerns about not accepting the results of election, it seemed to be more of an undercurrent than the the dominating element of the election. Uh, more maybe something that turned off uh, a sp- particular set of voters uh, that uh, that Republicans needed in order to win in some of these swing seats. So it was a number of things that added up. Mm-hmm. I think, again, the impression would be if you look at once again, if you look at the generic ballot, if you look at the subgroup data, if you look at the data for Hispanics, you look at the data for African Americans, and you just like saw nothing but that, like you would conclude, this was a great election for Republicans, and it's a it's a template for mm-hmm. 2024. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's absolutely um, a winning coalition uh, that would certainly be enough to win them the presidency in 2024, not just in the electoral college, but in the popular vote. Um, so you just look at that number in that environment in isolation, and you would say, yeah, this was this was an election. Now, maybe it wasn't an election that was the election we would have gotten in February or March, when I think we were legitimately on track for maybe a five to six point win in the generic ballot um, mm-hmm. for much larger seat gains in the House. And the row decision scrambled that for a while. Mm-hmm. And you saw that in primary turnout. Um, so the number that I like to track um, pretty religiously is the rate at which Republicans and Democrats turn out in primaries. And that went from an R plus six or seven advantage uh, prior to the Dobbs decision to an R plus one advantage. And, the, and our Republicans look like they're going to probably end up in, R, in the R plus one or R plus two range mm-hmm. on the generic ballot. So that proved to be correct, the post row political environment. We already knew that heading into Election Day. And I think the question was always going to be, well, how much ground can Republicans make up? Um, and it turns out they didn't make up that much ground as it relates to that. They made up some when you look at the special election in New York 18, for example, mm-hmm. over the summer, where the Democrat won a surprise victory. Well, Republicans swept the board in New York State on election night. Um, in fact, the losing candidate 
in that election went on to win uh, in, uh, in, in a different district, this should be noted, but he went on to win and win election to Congress in a Biden seat. Um, so they made up some ground, but they didn't make up all the ground. But this was kind of, if you had to just really boil it down, this was the election we thought we were going to have really up to maybe the second week of October. And it just, things got kind of carried away in terms of, you know, you know to some extent, uh, polls that were off or, or, um, or, or just general feeling in mm-hmm. the last few weeks. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that I have heard, you know, from people who were, uh, who seem to be kind of uh, paying more attention, you know, you're, you're above average, uh, engaged political viewer of Fox, for instance, uh, it, it, what is, you know, we, we feel really misled by these polling averages coming out of this. Uh, you know, we were looking at whether it's real clear, or whether it's some other average, you know, they were looking at a number basically that made them feel very confident uh, going into election night. When it comes to the attempts of these averages to tell an accurate story, which is what I believe they're trying to do, um, what's a a point of correction or a point that uh, you could take away from this experience about how to do that in a responsible way? Because I don't think, you know, uh, I, I don't think anybody wants to get that wrong, but the message that people were receiving clearly didn't match up with the result at the end of the night. I mean, let's be clear about what's happening here. And I'm pre- I pre- I have some pretty strong opinions about that, that you have um, the real clear politics average has purportedly actually excluded pollsters from their average um, versus the 538 average, which does not do that. 538 average was much more accurate. Um, you have pollsters mm-hmm. like Trafalgar or like, you know, like some others, who have to some extent traded on, uh, let's say this narrative of um, election denial or this idea that the votes we see on election day are not the true votes that are cast. Now those posters got lucky in 2020, right? And it does happen, right? That a set of posters uh, with let's say methods um, that might lean left or right you know, based not on anything, you know, just based on, you know, how they decide to conduct their polling can get lucky in one election. Uh, mm-hmm. And then that doesn't mean they're going to get lucky and be as lucky the next election. And I think that's very much what happened here. And I, I think the history of trying to um, predict polling error, if we just go beyond just sort of this immediate uh, Trump era, if we just think that, like, oh, we can just add two to three points to the Republican total because the polls were so wrong last time. That's not a good strategy, actually, at the end of the day. That, like, I mean, I I think that's because it was true in one or two elections. You know, back in 2014, I remember hearing the opposite. We should add two to three points to the Democratic number because Obama has this vaunted, fantastic GOTV operation. Um, But Mm -hmm. in actuality, polling errors... Polls miss equally for Republicans and equally for Democrats if you look at the wide sweep of history, and you can't really predict it. Now, a bunch of people, folks were going around and saying, we solved this, we fixed this problem, and now they have egg on their faces. Um, You know, I, I just think ultimately, look, I think... It is important to continue to take all these polls with a grain of salt. Um, I think there's a lot more uncertainty around polling results um, uh, than than I think is commonly assumed. And I do think that, like, Mm -hmm. you you know, the takeaway, if your takeaway from 2020 was that the polls are always biased or wrong in in a certain direction, I would just say, say, I would just be in a certain direction part of that. They're, They're wrong, you know, no matter what. I mean, it's some at some level. Mm-hmm. And they weren't quite as bad. Like, I mean, it, actually this, I mean, if you were looking in the right places, um, some some folks got it. I think the 538 average specifically got it pretty close to where it was in the national uh, generic ballot vote. Talk to me a little bit about the business side of the decisions made by a number of major entities to not go into the field in the closing weeks of the campaign. I've heard that 
you know, cited by a number of different folks. So I guess it's a, a, a point that is seeping out into kind of uh, uh, normie culture as opposed to just being among the political geeks of the world. Uh, to, uh, just explain to us what was kind of going on there and why places uh, didn't necessarily do uh, the kind of late stage polling that they have done in pre previous. Well, I think there was lots of polling overall from, let's say, these mainstream media outlets, and um, that's a function of declining response rates. Um, it's a function of, mm -hmm. um, it's, I mean, it's a function of a lot of things, but specifically declining response rates and you know the, the cost of doing polling. I mean, so it is a, a very labor intensive process. Um, you know, as far as going in late. I mean, I do think that, you know, maybe some people were scared off by, let's say, early voting. A lot of the voting had already occurred in these races. Um, I think that's a mistake. I think that, you know, if you are trying to rack up points for accuracy, um, you should get more accurate the closer you are to Election Day. It's not it's not a slam dunk that you will be. I think this year what is absolutely kind of went in the other direction. Um, but I think your prior going into this was that, you know, let's backload the polls. Um, but where the economics of this and where the, cause it is a, it is an economic decision ultimately where the economics of this play out is the complete lack of house race polling, because at least if you have a Pennsylvania, you know, that's going to reasonably, there's a reasonable chance that's going to decide the Senate. Uh, Georgia's re pretty good chance mm -hmm. it's going to decide the Senate uh, outcome, but an individual house race poll really, I mean, the, the impact of any individual house seat on control of the house on the ultimate seat count in the house. I mean, you're really talking it's one of 50 races as opposed to one of three to five races. So I think the economics of polling getting much more difficult this year meant that we had a lot less of it. I think you also had in, in, in 2018, I mean, I think there is a little bit of uh, a bias here too, that in 2018, you had this tremendous polling effort. I, I applaud it from the uh, New York Times uh, and Siena, uh, and Siena uh, University um, to poll about 70 house races. That just so happened to be a year where a lot of New York Times readers were really, really excited about the election and really interested in following the election, whereas they may not have been um, this year. Um, mm -hmm. They did some great polling. In fact, their House district polling was spot on in terms of predicting, well, Democrats are actually, you know, despite the national trends, they're actually holding on in some of these suburban House mm -hmm. seats. Uh, tell me in terms of the uh, suburban dynamic, because you brought that up, uh, what Republicans can do. It seems to me, and and I can't remember who tweeted this, but uh, it was I've seen multiple comments along these lines. Essentially, there's uh, the argument is you can't replace losses in the suburbs among particularly white women fast enough with the level of support that you're now getting from Hispanic Americans. Number one, do you think that's true? Uh, and number two, what can be done to maintain a coalition uh, where those two groups who have very different priorities and, and political uh, you know, makeup uh, are both groups where Republicans can compete? So I thoughts on this too, right? Uh, I think that um, part of this analysis is, um, and part of the underlying conclusion um, uh, of that is based on the election we just went through, which was a seat by seat battle for the house. Um, and that's really one of the biggest shortfalls came into play. Mm -hmm. Um, but ultimately a district by district battle for the house is very different than a state by state battle for the presidency where mm -hmm. uh, you don't actually see aside from outside of South Florida, outside of South Texas, outside of, let's say, um, David Valadeo's district, he has once again survived in that seat. You don't necessarily see Hispanics being um, sort of the pivotal voters in these seats. And, you know, frankly, Republicans have been so successful in moving a lot of those South Florida seats off the map that it hasn't, you know, it hasn't really factored in. Um, versus mm -hmm. a battle for the presidency where you have an Arizona, you have a Florida, you have, uh, well, Florida is now probably off the map presidentially, but uh, Arizona, Nevada, um, and other states where Hispanics are uh, an absolute key part of the coalition and an absolute key part of the mix. Um, I would also say don't sleep on the fact that 
Um, Republicans did notch a few points of, of extra support in the African-American community, which I know is sort of 13, 14 percent is nothing to write home about. That's a historic high for a midterm. Uh, now, in a state like Georgia, if that was to be sustained in a presidential year, um, that would potentially take Georgia off the map in the same way that Florida has been taken off the map. So I think these coalitional politics do play out differently. I do th absolutely think that in the House, particularly the way that Dems, I, I think, were very savvy in redistricting this cycle, um, the way it played out in the House battleground is a very is a battleground tilted towards those white suburbs. I don't think that will be the case when we're talking about um, 2024 and the race for the White House. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the things that people uh, certainly can take away from this cycle is that uh, the Republican tendency towards circular firing squads uh, remains um, and, and certainly is one that uh, was very much happening in the public eye in the wake of, of this election. Uh, I don't know that you ascribe blame to one uh, portion or another, but, you know, a couple of points that I've just made is that, you know, uh, Donald Trump can certainly endorse candidates, but it's the people who decide whether they want to uh, vote them through the primary or not. You know, that's some that's a choice that they make, you know, not that he makes. Um and, you know, you saw that have ramifications, I think, in a number of these states. Uh, additionally, I think that this was kind of another repeat of 20 in a certain sense, in the sense that there were several campaigns that I think never really made a successful pivot to the center in the wake of those primaries. Um, they, they kind of stuck to the same uh, uh, heavily... Trumpian influenced MAGA message that they use to win a primary without necessarily appealing to the center. I think you particularly saw that in a state like Arizona. Um, what is your overall takeaway about who we should blame or who Republicans uh, should uh, should look to as being, you know, the the individual or the organization that uh, that failed to deliver? So I think it's telling that Republicans uh, really overperformed in the Senate, both in 2016 and 2020, with Trump on the ballot, but not for the reasons that it's not I'm not going in the direction you might assume I'm going in. It's that they were able to juxtapose and they were able to contrast uh, with Trump and provide a favorable contrast with Trump where somebody could feel comfortable. Uh, say that suburban swing swing mom could feel comfortable mm -hmm. uh, voting for Joe Biden and then turning around and voting for a Rob Portman, <laughs> um, uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, somebody who's safe and responsible for the Senate. Um, and both in 2018 and 2022, um, you know, Republicans didn't have a foil, really. Uh, you know, all the bad energy mm -hmm. around Trump was visited upon Republican House and Senate candidates, and especially those candidates who Trump had endorsed. So there was a number of, number of mm -hmm. outlets have now done this analysis where the Trump endorsed candidates did five points worse than the candidates who did not get, get, get the endorsement. You also have this bad energy around election denialism, which was a complete, I mean, a, a complete train wreck for those candidates who did get through the primary embracing for a Joe Kent in Washington. Um, like none of those candidates won. I mean, it was an albatross mm -hmm. around their, uh, you know, around their, around their neck. And, um, you know, that was a dynamic that Trump himself created. Now, in an environment where, mm -hmm. okay, this, this was not an issue, right? I mean, you could you say, uh, you know, if, if Trump had sort of gone away after 20, uh, after 2020 or admitted his defeat, um, but still gone around and endorsed candidates. Um, you know, I just don't think he would have seen as much of a penalty, um, uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, but because, you know, he remains less popular than potentially the House and Senate candidates and the down ballot candidates on the whole, um, that did, I think we found, I think, pretty clear. I think that, I think we saw pretty clear evidence in this cycle that um, yeah, that that was um, that was a factor, and every even a few points matters, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you talk about five points; it's not it's not necessarily 
always the difference between winning or losing, but it is a difference between winning or losing in all the states we really care about and all the places we really care about. Mm -hmm. Uh, last question. Uh, the the thing that seems to me to be one interesting aspect of this that people uh, don't really talk about, I and mean, I don't know why they don't talk about it, is so many of the people who lost this time around uh, were truly outsiders, political outsiders, inexperienced with running at all, let alone in a statewide election. Um, and while it certainly could be an advantage at various points in political history to be an outsider, Statistically, it is way better to be someone who has run statewide, you know, introduced themselves to the voters before is a known quantity. So you look at a race, for instance, like in Pennsylvania, and you have an outsider, a famous outsider in, in Dr. Oz, um, literally, you know, not someone who lives in the state, unfortunately, <laughs> to his great misfortune um, uh, most of the time. Uh, and th then you had, you know, John Fetterman, who looked, you know, from the national perspective, I think a lot of people, you know, were writing him off as just being kind of this joke of a candidate. But I kept saying to people, hey, look, he's running this state and he's won. You know, he's he's been someone who is a a politically known quantity to a certain degree. Uh, and that is an advantage. And so you look at the people who won this time around with Trump's. Uh, backing and it's people like Ted Budd, you know, it's it's people like uh, Eric, <laughs> you know, it's people like, uh, uh, you know, even even you look at someone like J.D. Vance, who had to spend a, the amount of money that he did. He was still more of a known quantity than I think someone like Lake Masters, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, a lot of people who were really making their first political foray of any kind. What lesson do you take away about the performance of outsiders? In this I mean, look, I think that in um, it was a flight to safety. I mean, in a lot of places um, that um, I, I, I do think that um, particularly when you're looking at an environment where, um, you know, Republicans are favored to win or, you know, a lot of Republicans should win. And this was reflected in the um, candidate recruitment um, that you had very large primary fields, you had contested primaries in most cases um, throughout these states. Um, you had um, Republicans uh, run fewer candidates in more House races than Democrats. Um, so usually when you're expecting a year or two out for it to be a good election cycle, um, you get kind of the cream of the crop of, of candidates. Now, part of this is in a state like Georgia, right? I mean, I, I, I think that um, because it wasn't always the case that, you know, you have these divisive primaries and the Trump endorsed candidate won. And, you know, that state is still, you know, absolutely still on the map. Um, but, you know, do you wonder about even a, a, a previous office holder like Doug Collins? Would he not have had as, had as mm -hmm. much trouble? And would he have won without a runoff? If you have really, if you have an environment um, that favors Republicans, even on the margins, do you nominate candidates who, for better or worse, bring their own baggage, their own personality, um, who may bring a lot of negatives to the table? Mm -hmm. Or do you nominate completely safe candidates like Adam Laxalt, like Ted Budd? Now, I would note that even though Adam Laxalt didn't win, mm -hmm. he was one of the two candidates, along with Bud, in these competitive Senate races that outperformed Trump. The other, I think, was Ron Johnson, who was the only incumbent of the set. Um, so I think it's, it, it is a lesson uh, for the future. But I say that's necessarily the best strategy, let's say, in a, in a tougher environment. Maybe not. Maybe you want to roll the dice, right, in a 2018-style environment uh, where you know, the generic Republican voting record isn't going to get you across the finish line. But I would argue in a 2022 environment, uh, you might want to play it safer. And I think we learned that. Mm -hmm. Man, voters, as much as they hate the way that things are going, it seems like they want normalcy too, along with, along with their change. <laughs> and that's always the confusing part of politics. Patrick Ruffini, thank you Thanks, so much man. for taking the time to join me today.